by definition, the curvature of a parametric curve is based on an arc length parameterization as the rate of the magnitude of the rate of change of the unit tangent vector. If R of S is an arc length parameterization of the curve, the curvature denoted by kappa of S is defined to be the magnitude of capital T prime of S, where capital T of S is V of S divided by its magnitude. And actually that's the same as V of S in this context, because arc length parameterizations travel at unit speed one unit of distance per unit of time. That's what arc length parameterization means. The magnitude of V of S is always one. The speed as a function of the arc length is one. That doesn't mean the velocity vector is constant because it could be turning. If the curve is real tight, like a small circle, the curvature is large. If the curve is not real tight, like a really big circle, which I won't even try to try to draw, then the curvature is small. If the graph is straight, then the curvature equals zero. It's measuring how curvy it is. While this is the definition of curvature, effectively measuring how fast the unit tangent vector changes as S goes changes. It's going to change direction, not length. It changes very rapidly with, with a small circle, for example, very slowly with a, an almost straight curve, not at all with a straight line. While that's a good definition of the curvature, it's not a very useful calculation tool. There are other formulas that are actually, they're more complicated looking, but they're actually easier to use. Because the problem is coming up, the main problem with this is coming up with an arc length parameterization. We did that before the exam. I thought I made a mistake, but I didn't. How do we do that? I won't go through the details again, but we effectively found the inverse function of this involving a two-thirds power in the end, and plug that into f and g in place of t. We tried simplifying it, and I tried seeing that the graph of the velocity was horizontal, but I accidentally did the graph of uh, not the velocity, but something else. That was my mistake. There are other formulas for the curvature in this box, in three different special cases. First one's probably the easiest to use. If the curve is defined not parametrically, but as a function, y equals f of x, then the curvature at any value of x is given by that equation. They didn't write kappa of x there, but they could have. The author could have written kappa, kappa of x. Kappa is a function of x here. It's the absolute value of the second derivative divided by, kind of crazy, one plus the first derivative squared all to the three halves power. That's if you've got an ordinary graph of an ordinary function in the plane. You could think of this as a parametric curve, by the way, if you let x equal to t and y equal to f of t, but you'd still use the exact same formula. If you've got a planar parametric curve that's not the graph of a function, maybe it's a circle, it fails the vertical line test, use this formula involving their first and second derivatives. In the general case for three-dimensional space, you got to use one of these formulas, the middle one of which involves a cross product. Quite often, the middle one's the easiest one to use, even though it involves a cross product. 
Again, it's not clear where these formulas come from. They can be derived. We don't have time. Okay, so you are trusting that they're right and trying to use them. Some homework problems, not only have you use these to get a formula, but also have you do things like figure out where the curvature is maximized. You could take the derivative of the cur curvature, set it equal to zero and solve for t, find a critical point. Yeah, it doesn't sound so nice, but you could just do it graphically. You could graph the curvature as a function of x in this case, or as a function of t in these cases, and graph them as ordinary graphs with a plain old plot in mathematical or regular function mode in your calculator and estimate where the maximum is. Probably more important than all that is the intuitive interpretation. For this curve here, for example, you can see at the point B, it's almost straight. So the curvature is large, excuse me, small. And if you approximated the curve near that point with a circle, that circle would have a large radius because the curvature is small. In fact, the radius of the circle would be one over the curvature. If the curvature is small, one over cur the curvature would be large. And here where the curve is tight, the curvature is high, the radius, the circle is small. If kappa is large, one over kappa, the radius of this circle is small. If you wanted to, you could make an animation of the motion along the curve and see how the circle changes as you move along the curve. I think I will before I put the notebook on Moodle. I'll add the circle to the picture and you'll see the motion, not only of the particle, but also I'll put the unit tangent vector, unit normal vector in the picture, velocity and acceleration vectors. And I'll put these circles in there and you can see how the size of the circle changes as the curvature changes. The circle as a name is called the osculating circle. Osculating means kissing. It's like the circle is kissing the curve. That's why it's called osculating. It's a Latin root. Okay. It gets, we don't have time for this, but it gets even more fun in three dimensions. Not only do you have the unit tangent vector, that's the best approximation to the curve in three dimensions at a point, you also have the osculating circle, and the osculating circle defines an osculating plane that the curve is somehow in three dimensions, most in the osculating plane at any moment in time. But that oscillating plane changes as you move around the, the curve. It gets pretty wild, pretty interesting, in fact. This is the basics of something called differential geometry, the geometry of curves, and it's a pretty wild subject. <laughs>